Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I'm John Tierney. Uh, welcome to the Museum of Sex here. I, I'm, uh, I am here to talk with Roy Baumeister at this event. Thank you, Reason Magazine, for sponsoring this, and thank you, Dan Gluck, for inviting us here. Um, I'm here to talk with Roy Baumeister, my uh, co-author of the book, Willpower, and we want to talk about, uh, about that subject, about New Year's resolutions, and we want to uh, also unveil a, st a strategy, a self-help strategy that, as far as I know, is the only one to have been field tested in the Oval Office. Um, after President Barack Obama read our work, he changed his daily routine to improve his decision making. Now, I'm not saying he made all the right decisions since then. I imagine there are some people here who do not regard him as the Solomon of our age. But I want to assure you that if he had not followed the strategy uh, that Roy and I developed, the things today would be much worse. <laughs> and, and I also want to assure you that it was not used, the strategy was not used to develop the healthcare gov website. Now, I realize that there are, are probably many people here who are tired of hearing exhortations and lectures from self-improvement gurus. And believe me, I feel your pain. I, I have read more bad self-help books than Oprah and Dr. Phil combined. Uh, I mean, that's what got me into this uh, collaboration with Roy, really. It, it started indirectly for me, where I, I was at dinner one night with Christopher Buckley, the comic novelist, and we were talking about the deep philosophical subject that always comes up when writers get together, which is money. And we decided that we needed more of it. And we were so jealous of the, of the mega sales of self-help books that we decided to write one of our own. And it was, it was a comic novel titled God is My Broker. And we revealed the seven and a half laws of spiritual and financial growth. There were the, these were eternal truths like money is God's way of saying thanks. And, and my favorite law was uh, as long as God knows the truth, it doesn't matter what you tell your customers. <laughs> now, now, in writing this book, I went back through the history of the self-help genre, all the way from Ben Franklin to the present. And I noticed this sort of curious trend. If you went back in the 19th century and the Victorians, the self-help books then emphasized perseverance and hard work. They, they had maxims like, genius is patience. But then when you moved into the modern era, you got these books promising quick fixes and self-esteem and the sort of feel-good philosophy uh, with a rhyming slogan, believe it, achieve it. You know, Deepak Chopra had something he called the law of least effort, and, 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 and I'll quote it verbatim. It said, ultimately, you come to the state where you do nothing and accomplish everything. <laughs> you know, I guess it worked for him, you know, but, but you know, I, to me, it seemed there had been this weird backward evolution that the old books were better than the new books. And I didn't know what to make of this until I started writing a science column for the New York Times, and I, and I met, uh, or, uh, Roy Baumeister, I heard about, he's one of the most prolific social psychologists on the planet. And Roy got his start, he was one of the early leaders in the research into self-esteem, which showed that people who are more confident, people, um, uh, uh, people with more confidence in themselves tend to be happier and more successful. But then Roy realized that the researchers had it backwards, that uh, self-esteem does not lead to success, rather success leads to self-esteem. You know, winning the Nobel Prize will make you feel good about yourself, but, but, but uh, feeling good about yourself will not get you to Stockholm. If it did, Donald Trump would be there every year. So, um, so Roy looked at dozens of personality traits, and he found that only one of them predicted how well a student would do in college. And that trait, it was not self-esteem, it was self-control. And this was something that had been kind of out of fashion, but more and more studies started showing that no matter what kind of successful outcome you looked at it, in school, in, in, in careers, in marriages, in relationships, financial security, health, that in general there were two qualities that correlate with success. And one of them is intelligence, the other is self-control. And so far researchers um, haven't figured out 
what to do about intelligence, but they have rediscovered how to uh, improve self-control. And they have rediscovered the concept of willpower, which until Roy came along, scientists in the 20th century had, had looked on willpower as this kind of quaint metaphor invented by uptight Victorians. You know, Victorians thought of the body like there was a, a steam engine inside you, and when you had some terrible temptation, like, you know, like the sight of a bare ankle, uh, you just powered up the steam engine and you went and you took a cold shower. And now, the Victorians were rather odd. I don't think they'd be really comfortable here at the Museum of Sex. But Roy discovered that they actually were correct. I mean, not about everything. He doesn't share their ankle fetish. But he discovered that they were right about willpower. And I'd like Roy now to tell us why, um, how that happened. Well, we, uh, we started doing experiments. I mean, first I surveyed the, the literature and I thought, well, this could be that, there, that the willpower uh, thing seemed uh, viable, that there was some energy. At the time, nobody in psychology was using energy theories. Everything was, the brain is a little computer and information processing is all what it's about and it calculates what you're supposed to do and then you do it. Uh, but uh, we said, well, could this, could this still be true? A lot of the data are looking like there's, uh, there's some energy uh, in, involved there. So we started doing these laboratory experiments. And sure enough, after you know, we'd have people first control their thoughts, you know, tell them not to think about something, and then measure their physical stamina. And their physical stamina was worse, that trying to control their thoughts and shut that annoying thought out of their mind had actually you had taken something out of them. Uh, or we had them watch a funny comedy and try to keep a poker face, don't laugh. And that, that took something out of them, and then they would do worse on, uh, on another test of self-control. One of the, the biggest ones was uh, um, we had people uh, resist temptation to eat. We had, a, we had to contrive this for a while. We, you can't tell people in, in psychology what you're going to study about them because it makes them all weird. If we told them we're, we're going to test your self-control, you can imagine by the time they got to the laboratory, they'd be all shaken and suspicious and, uh, and so on. So we told them we're just going to uh, study how well people can remember certain tastes. Uh, so they come in, and, and then uh, my colleagues came up with this clever thing where we had uh, set up an, a microwave oven and bake uh, f chocolate chip cookies. And you know, the microwave blows out the scent, so it really smelled awfully good. And we told them to skip lunch you know, before the, the experiment so their taste buds would be fresh, so they're hungry. Uh, and then they're all smelling these chocolates and, and, and cookies and all hungry for them. We sit them down at a table, and there's a stack of these cookies and chocolate candies looking up. And also there, there's a bowl of radishes. And, and, and for the crucial condition, we said, well, you've been assigned to the radish condition, so we're going to have you eat radishes and don't touch the car chocolate or cookies that are for other people. Um, and to maximize the temptation, we, we left them alone for five minutes. Uh, of course, we didn't trust them. Uh, so we secretly observed, and oh, they looked like they were tempted. They're longingly glancing at the cookies. Or they're uh, you know, gnawing on this one puny little radish. Uh, and they're picking up the cookies and smelling them and putting them back or <laughs> dropping them on the floor. And but anyway, they all managed. Nobody actually bit into the, the forbidden food. And they all managed to eat the better part of a, a radish. We had others who we told, go ahead and eat the chocolates. And we also had some with no food. But the ones who were interested in the ones who had to sit there seeing those chocolates and smelling those chocolates and wanting those chocolates, but instead had to eat, make themselves eat those, those stupid radishes. So after a few minutes, they resisted temptation. Then we took them into a, uh, uh, another room. And by a procedure from stress research, was how long do people keep trying at a difficult puzzle before they give up? Uh, and sure enough, they quit uh, way faster if they'd been in the radish condition. Uh, the, the resisting the temptation to eat those cookies had taken something out of them that, that then they didn't have enough to make themselves keep trying and keep going and keep struggling uh, to solve that difficult puzzle. Uh, so anyway, lots and lots of these experiments suggest that, yeah, there's some kind of energy uh, that's, that's used up, and, and the, as John said, the old folk notion of willpower uh, has some truth to it, that the mind is not just a computer, uh, although computers run on energy too, although nobody was, <laughs> was talking about that in psychology, uh, but rather there, there are some energy processes and some things uh, take, uh, take more than others. Um, so uh, that was a, c a crucial step forward. Um, what else? Um, so um, after you... Um, discovered that, uh, that willpower was this, uh, uh, this kind of mental energy. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of questions that came up. One was, how do you, um, what is the source of this energy? Um, okay. Um, well, it, it emerged over time that it seems to be uh, tied into the body's basic energy supply. I mean, there's a chemical called glucose in your bloodstream, 
Now that carries energy from the, the stores. Uh, it's, it makes fuel for the brain, uh, for the brain cells to fire, also powers your muscles and, uh, and other things like that. Um, and, and nutritionists had collected a lot of data over time without much of a theory that uh, when people's blood sugar gets low and they don't have that much glucose, their self-control breaks down. And diabetics who actually have uh, fluctuating, sometimes they have very high blood sugar, but it doesn't do them any good because their body isn't using it. Um, you know, they have self-control problems. Uh, also studies of like juvenile delinquents and, and other people, they uh, seem to have uh, blood, blood sugar issues. They experimentally test things like uh, they'll have to tell a whole class of kids to not have breakfast one day. So all the kids come and nobody's eaten anything. They randomly assign half the kids to get breakfast and half to not get any breakfast. And then they see what happens. And sure enough, the ones who didn't get any food, uh, they learn worse and they behave worse until 10 o'clock when everybody gets a snack and then all the differences disappear. Uh, there's even a study with judges. Uh, I didn't get into the decision-making uh, thing yet, but it turns out making decisions also draws on the same energy. Uh, so after you make a lot of choices, your willpower is down. Uh, I'm surprised politicians haven't started using this as an excuse for all the sex scandals and stuff. That, <laughs> well, I'm making a lot of difficult decisions, you know. It uses up. Uh, but, you know, it would be valid. It, we, we do get that, that kind of effect uh, in there. Anyway, there's a study with the Israeli parole judges it looks at, uh, you know, do they do the easy thing and just send them right back, or do they actually let the, the, the ones who have uh, uh, paid their debt and earned it you know, be paroled and go out in society? Well, it turns out first one comes up in the morning has a very good chance of, uh, uh, of getting parole. But the judges are making these decisions all day long, and it's a lot of information and a lot of, it's kind of grueling. Uh, and so the likelihood that the guy will get paroled just goes down, down, down as the day goes on until actually mid-morning they have a break and they get a snack and they get an apple and, and so forth. And then suddenly the next guy has a good chance of getting paroled again. And then it goes down, down, down until just before lunch is like a, a 10 or 15 percent chance of getting paroled. Uh, whereas the first one after lunch has like two-thirds chance uh, of getting in. So if you're ever in this situation, which I, I hope you're not, uh, and you're, you know, they say, well, we can take one more before lunch, say, no, 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 I'll wait till after lunch, because uh, it really makes a big difference. I mean, there's a phrase lawyers use that justice is what the, what the judge had for breakfast, but it appears breakfast, snack, and lunch all have a significant impact into the, uh, uh, the decision-making uh, process there. So um, uh, it is tied into the energy supply. Uh, when the immune system, for example, uses a lot, I know there are a lot of colds and things going around. If you've been exposed to something like that, your body immune system takes a lot of energy to fight off the cold. In that case, your decisions will be worse, your self-control will be worse. Uh, it's part, you know, it's just a natural process. It, there's nothing wrong with you. Just you got to understand the body has a certain economy of how it uses its energy, uh, resisting temptation or you know, behaving properly or not saying uh, something unkind. You know, that's one of its priorities, but fighting disease is a higher priority, and so there'll be less uh, left over for it at that time. Mm -hmm. So. Um this discovery by Roy's of willpower and, and the fact that it can be depleted, uh, um, he named it um, ego depletion, um, which um, he borrowed the term from Freud, that the, uh, uh, the part of your mind that controls your impulses. And, and, and so ego depletion you know, sets in on, on everyone. It basically, the same way those judges um, um, became depleted as the day wore on and couldn't make a decision, it's been documented in lots of studies where they've looked at, at shoppers in malls and they find that people who've done the more shopping have less self-control later. They've done uh, uh, some really interesting real-world studies where they, with car buyers where th uh, they start out uh, um, Someone who buys a car and, and he has to make has to go down this list of options about what kind of engine. You might have 13 different kinds of engines and in 200 different you know colors for the interior. Is it taupe or camel or um, ivory? There's so many shades of brown. And what they find is that people will start trying to make the decision, but as they go down the list, they just give up and they start taking the default option. And the researchers experimented with that and they and they. Um, vary the order of the decisions. Sometimes they put the expensive decisions, like the engine, first. Sometimes they put the, uh, the expensive decisions last. And then it made a huge difference in what people chose, about $2,000 per car. Um, and, and so 
Our message yeah, because is the standard option is often one of the more expensive ones. So, right, uh, right. As so, people go and just take whatever standard as they get, as their willpower gets used up and they don't want to think about it and make any more choices, they just say, okay, I'll just take whatever standard. Right. Uh, and that can cost you. Yeah. Um, so our take is, is that all of us really like those car buyers today because we're just bombarded by decisions and, and temptations all day long. The modern world really offers you a lot more than there ever were before. Um, one so study Roy bring did. Bring up the uh, President yeah. Obama thing you mentioned earlier. Uh, after he read the, the Times coverage of our stuff, uh, he said, well, I'm just going to wear blue and gray suits from now on. I don't want to make spend any energy deciding what to wear or what to eat. Right. right. And so make no more decisions. That was his... Um, his reaction, um, which is a good strategy to yeah. do that, um, because um, some more research of Roy has sh and, and some researchers in Germany and uh, in the Netherlands, they've tracked people all day long and asked them what they're experiencing at any one moment, and they found that the typical person during a day spends between three and four hours resisting desires, basically, just, uh, you know, the desire to eat, the desire to yawn at your boss, the desire to... Um, you know, just having to exert self-control, and then and that didn't even really count all the decisions they have to make, which is even right. more. Yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of demands on it. Yeah. So you're basically being depleted all day long, and um, so we've um, in willpower. We talked about the findings behind this, and, and we also just to give you help with the New Year's resolutions, what we promised to do. Uh, I'll sort of break down the, the um, I'll summarize this in the great spirit of self-help books, you have to have numbered laws, you know that. <laughs> um, and I'm going to do better than seven and a half, I'm going to do eight. Um, so, so here are eight strategies for the New Year's resolution, which is number one, which is know your limits. The, the basically what I've just been saying, that, that you only have a finite amount of, of willpower, and the more you use it, it gets depleted. So, you know, as far as New Year's resolution, the first thing to know about that is don't make more than one. Because if you make more than one, they're competing against each other. But can I add, uh, yeah, when this is exactly right. If people make a list of New Year's resolutions and every time you work on one, it uses up some willpower and takes away your ability to work on others. Uh, and I don't want to say don't make New Year's resolutions, or, yes. but do them sequentially mm -hmm. um, rather than all at once. Pick the easiest one and do that first mm -hmm. uh, because you, you can actually strengthen your willpower by following through and doing and succeeding at it. Mm -hmm. uh, so start, uh, start with the easy one. But yeah, one at a time. Right. And there's no obvious sign. You know, Roy and other researchers looked for what does it feel like when you're um, suffering from ego depletion, when your willpower is low? And, and what's the answer to that? Um, there's no particular sig signature feeling, but everything strikes you a little bit more intensively. You, f you desire things more, you react more strongly, uh, and so on. So when, you're, uh, when your willpower is down, you'll just feel things more strongly. Uh, things start bothering you more than they should. Uh, it could be a sign you're getting sick, because again, that, takes, uh, mm -hmm. that uses up some of your glucose. Because uh, you've lost the capacity to, to, to control to, your to reaction. Yeah, yeah, people are, are often damping down their reactions. It's part, I think, of how we live in a civilized society is we kind of keep all our desires and feelings and uh, nasty sexual museum type thoughts in, sec in check. Uh, and not so nasty, the, not nasty. The, the, uh, well, those, okay, the nice ones too, but uh, particularly the nasty ones have to be kept in check. Um, so they'll emerge a little more strongly when your, uh, your, your central self-control is, uh, is weakened. Okay. So uh, 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 the second strategy is to build your willpower. And uh, Roy likes to use the analogy about uh, a willpower being like a muscle. Do you want to explain that? Uh, sure. Uh, like a muscle, I mean, the depletion effect is like a muscle when you exercise it or exert it, it gets tired uh, for a while. But uh, if you exercise regularly, it will get stronger. And uh, there are at least a dozen published studies, uh, often very impressive results, uh, that show if having people do self-control exercises for two or three weeks uh, can uh, improve their capacity uh, to do things quite different from what they exercised. It, uh, you know, they're bringing them in, we'll give them lab tests of self-control that had nothing to do with uh, the exercises they were doing. But you know, there's one muscle for self-control, and it's one resource that you use the same willpower for everything. Uh, it's limited, so people use it for one thing, not others. But um, making it, you know, exercising it will make it stronger, and that will help you tackle whatever other challenges you decide to mm -hmm. apply it to. And the kind of exercise, I mean, in the experiments they did, one where they just sent students home and told them to work on their posture the next two weeks. Right. And whenever you, you know, think of it, just sit up straight, stand up straight. 
Right, and, uh, and to, our, to our surprise, uh, we, we brought them in and did laboratory tests of stamina and mental control and things like that. And they did, they did better uh, on those things, just from working on their posture. It's the old Victorian idea of building character, that you know, exerting self-control is good for you. Well, it turns out they were right about that too, mm -hmm. or at least there's something to it, that it, it does strengthen your character. It makes you a stronger person uh, to exert self-control mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And, and that's probably uh, one of the reasons that you know studies have repeatedly shown that religious people tend to have more self-control than non-religious people. Now, now, part of that may be a selection bias. It takes a certain amount of self-control to go to church and do that. But but all religions encourage these practices: meditation, prayers, fasting. They encourage all these exercises that basically build that willpower muscle. Now, you don't have to be religious to do it, but just meditating builds up that. Now, I'll, I'll move on. We uh, I don't want to. I want to open this up for questions soon, but I'll just I'll work through the strategy. The number th uh, three strategy is is the is the best one. Eat, you know that you have to eat to have self control. I love to do that in a place with food, um, and this is what we call the dieters catch twenty two. It's why dieting people often think of dieting as the ultimate you know, example of self-control. It's an easy example to use. But of all the things that, uh, that I have and, and researchers have studied, self-control correlates with success in everything. But when it comes to losing weight, the correlation is much weaker than it is, say, with, with academic stuff. And that's because of this complicated reaction that if you starve yourself, you don't have self-control. So it's a very, it, it's this catch-22 that in order um, to diet, uh, in order to have self-control, you need to eat, but in order to lose weight, you need not to eat. So so it's very difficult. Yeah. Um, so uh, the fourth uh, strategy is to avoid the planning fallacy, which is um, uh, this is something that that um, all of us tend to underestimate how long something will take. It's one of the problems in making plans for the new year. And and uh, uh, one of our studies, you found that other people basically underestimated how long it would take to do a paper by about half, right? That was oh, uh, yes. So there are a number of studies like this. Uh, there's this one where they ask students, uh, what's the best case and your worst case for how long it will take you to get your thesis done? And you know nobody even finished by the worst case. So the best case was not was off the charts. The, the only accurate predictions they got in that study was sometimes they asked the roommate, how long do you think it's going to take him to get it done? <laughs> the roommates knew. <laughs> um, the uh, fifth strategy is to make a to-do list that's actually doable. Um, and the problem most people have is that they put stuff on to-do lists that, that, that it's a vague thing like hire a new sales rep, but you don't really know how to do that. You have to be, it has to be very specific. Um, I'll, I'll just mention very quickly one of my favorite findings in the book, which was about the Zagarnik effect, which is this, um, an effect discovered in the 20s by, by Bluma Zagarnik, a psychology student in Berlin. And she, and she went to, uh, to a restaurant with some colleagues one day and the waiter took their order. And he didn't write anything down, it was a big group, and he came back, served everybody perfectly. They were really impressed. After lunch, one of the psychologists goes back because he's forgotten something. And he sees the waiter and he asks him for help, hoping he'll benefit from this man's excellent memory. And the waiter just looks back at him blankly. He has no idea who the guy is. And he explains that once he delivers an order, it vanishes from his mind. So the psychologists start thinking, is there a big difference between finished and unfinished tasks? And they found, indeed, that there is, that the brain keeps nagging at you at an unfinished task. Now, obviously, when you've got you know, 200 emails and you've got phone calls and all these things, you can't finish every task at once. So stuff is going to nag at you. But Roy found a way in his laboratory where, you know, to turn off that Zagarnik effect, basically. Yes, if you make a very specific plan uh, for exactly what you're going to do, uh, that seems to turn off the, the nagging effect. A general plan, like, you know, buy a present for mother or something. Uh, that isn't there, but you know, go to the store tomorrow at three. These, these intrusive thoughts about the unfinished, unfinished business, unfulfilled goals, uh, the unconscious is bothering the consciousness to, you know, not to get it done necessarily, but to give it something very specific that it can watch for and say, okay, when this happens, then I'll know uh, to take the next step. And that's all the unconscious needs. And then it can stop pestering you with those uh, intrusive thoughts that you haven't put away the dirty dishes yet, or the clean dishes, you yeah. put away the dirty dishes. Um, a great guide for doing that is, is a book, Getting Things Done by David Allen, the GTD system. Pro I'm sure you know many people here know that, but uh, one of our favorite experiences doing the book was we went and visited David Allen and 
in California, and it's an amazing experience. You go into his office, he's got about this big L-shaped desk, it's about six feet on each side, and you look at it and it's 12 feet of naked wood. There's nothing in his inboxes, nothing on his desk. That's his whole system is you've got to get rid of stuff, you've got to basically get rid of the Zagarnik effect. You've got to, you know, everything that comes on his desk, every email, he makes a plan to deal with it. He's got tickler files and, you know, and the result is you've got a clean mind to do what you can. I mean, David likes to say that, you know, that if you need cat food and you want to find God, you have to get the cat food first, you know, don't? Um, so, so, and he's got lots of tips for basically making a to-do list and getting stuff done so it's very specific. Now, we're, we're moving on here. Um, number six, a very basic strategy, but, but it's, it, it's overlooked sometimes, is it's not enough just to set goals and resolutions for the new year. You have to keep track. That's just fundamental to all exercise of self-control, is setting a goal and keeping track. If you want to spend less money, keep track of it every week. If you want to lose weight, weigh yourself every day. That's, that's one of the few clinically proven ways to lose weight. So. Yes, ironically, for years, the conventional wisdom had been don't weigh yourself every day because weight fluctuates and it'll be discouraging and so on. And that was the one thing that, that went against what we were saying because we thought uh, keeping track is better. It's hard to control something if you're not keeping track of it. Uh, but then a study came out about two or just before we did the book that uh, said, oh, the people who actually weigh themselves every day do the best mm -hmm. at uh, keeping their weight down and, and keeping control of it. Yeah. Yes, that's what we do. Yeah, um, you know, keeping track is kind of a bore, but it, but the nice thing is that there are lots of smartphone apps. Uh, there's a website called the Quantified Self that has all these apps and gadgets that will keep track of of what you do on your computer. It'll even um, it'll shut off the web. There are some apps that uh, that will you know send a note to your boss telling you how much time you spent on on the Museum of Sex website, on the Reason website, <laughs> if you want. All these things basically to, uh, to monitor you, to, you know, what you spend your time on, and you know, how many steps you take, everything. So just keeping track is a very basic thing. And it, it is easier now because there's a lot of technology that will do it for you. Um, strategy number seven is what we call the nothing alternative, which is named, uh, uh, which we borrowed from Raymond Chandler, the great, uh, uh, a mystery writer. Um, he managed to turn out masterpieces like The Big Sleep by following, he would go into his office every day for, for hours and he would follow, two, he had two rules. A, you don't have to write. B, you can't do anything else. Um, and his idea was that eventually you're going to get so bored you'll do the work. And that's, um, and, and, and so I think that's a great strategy for anyone to, to say take the first 90 minutes of your day um, open the the, uh, the smartwatch, uh, 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 the smartphone app for you know, you know for a stopwatch, and don't do anything apart from your primary project that day. No phone calls, no no web stuff. Only stuff that's related to your to your primary project. Um, and, and and now I'm I'm done to strategy number eight, the final one, and this is really the most important one because it's conserve your willpower. Um, I this thought you were going to say buy our book. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, <laughs> that's the eighth and a half. The, um, this is the one that President Obama was doing. And, and, it, um, and, and this flows, I mean, it, um, from another study that uh, Roy did with, with some colleagues that, that surprised them because they were tracking people all day long. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, just to remind you a bit, though, that, um, and they found that, and they were looking to, for the correlation between people who had best self control and how often they exercised self control. And they expected that the people, you know, with the best self-control would be using it all day long because they were so strong, but they found the opposite, right? Yeah, significantly the other way, the people with high self-control actually spend less time resisting temptations and desires. And so, well, how could that be? Uh, but they stay out of trouble. Uh, we call this in the book playing offense, not defense. A lot of people think self-control is something you use in the moment of crisis, uh, in, in the heat of temptation or whatever, that that's when you call on it. Well, the people with good self-control plan not to be exposed to temptation. They set up their lives to run smoothly, and then they don't have these problems. Uh, and that, that actually works, uh, works way better. Uh, right. It is the kind of thing where, I mean, what Obama was doing basically was outsourcing his self-control, his decisions to someone else. And that we don't all have the kind of staff he does, to someone else to choose your food for you. But you can outsource, instead of deciding every morning whether to exercise or not, you can just set up an appointment with a friend. So you basically outsource the, you know, that self-control. You don't have to make yourself do it. 
And, and you can outsource a lot of this stuff you know, to computers that will nudge you when to do things, friends that will do it, Facebook groups, that kind of thing. There's a, there's a huge uh, benefit between good self-control and success in work and school. Uh, you think, well, what do you need willpower for there? Is it for staying up all night to get the paper done or the presentation for the next day? Uh, well, I suppose that, that does take it, but that's not what people with good self-control do. They, they start early and get it done uh, ahead of time so they don't have to spend the night before the deadline uh, staying up all night. Now, I, I, I used to hate to hear this because I've been a procrastinator <laughs> all my life. I don't think I've ever turned in a New York Times column ahead of time, you know. Um, usually after the deadline, um, and I never turn in college papers on time. When I started working with Roy and started doing these um, these strategies, we actually um, turned in the book two months ahead of time, and our editor is still not recovered from the shock of it. I think the writers' union wanted to break our hands, you know, if we had to do this. So, um, so I can tell you that the strategies do work, and. Um, um, and, and we'd be glad to take any more questions from you if, you, if, uh, if you'd like. What is the magnitude? So, sure, yeah. So when you're talking about both preserving your willpower and exercising it to grow it, what is the magnitude of different you can expect from these as compared to the magnitude we know genetics plays from the separated twin literature? All right. So you want an answer like in percent of the variance or something like that? I mean, I don't know quite how to answer. I can compare um, the uh, you know, the genetic effects are mostly interactive with. Uh, uh, it turns out pure gene effects are, are fairly small in most things. Maybe not with intelligence, but most other things. Uh, it's it's the interaction between the genes and environment. The pure environment effects are even smaller. Uh, but interactions between them seem to be where the lion's share of the variance is. I think with uh, self-control, we do find when we, we give people these exercises, the people who start off with pretty good self-control benefit more from the exercises. Uh, but it's probably because they do the exercises more. The other people <laughs> say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll do them. But then they, they don't go home and they don't bother to s work on their posture or, uh, or not swear or whatever we assign them to, uh, to do. Um, nonetheless, uh, well, here's one, one way to, to uh, put it. Uh, one of my former PhD students published a paper about uh, two, three years ago. Uh, we try to get people to quit smoking. And that's one of the hardest. I mean, quitting smoking is the graveyard of psychological theories. No, nothing works. Um, <laughs> but uh, he had a bunch of people and had them do exercises for several weeks of uh, regulating, their, you know, resisting their desires and you know, being good and stuff like that. So it had nothing to do with smoking. You just build up their willpower with sort of simple self-control exercises and then had them try to quit smoking. And it tripled the success rate, which you know, went like from 5% to 15%. It's not like 90% of them suddenly were, were there. But, but still, 5% uh, to 15, that, that's, uh, that's a huge effect uh, there. Uh, hello, I'm Stanton Peel, and in four weeks I'm going to be appearing here with yeah, John yeah, okay. and Sally Sattel talking about addiction. John, I was really curious, when you began, you talked about how we've gone downhill in terms of our views of self-help because early, in an earlier era, we were more willing to recognize self-control, and now that's almost a negative concept that you have to market against. So I was going to ask you why you think that is, and before I get your answer, I want to propose why I think okay. that is. I think you're marketing against the entire addiction model of powerlessness which comes both from AA, but also modern neuroscience, both the, and the hijacked brain. Mm -hmm. So how I interpret your work in, in my most recent book, uh, Recover, is that we've gone away from something that makes a lot of logical common sense because we've been told that we're not able to exercise self-control. Mm -hmm. And I view the world as being a kind of marketing of memes and you're coming back with an idea, well, willpower and self-control, everybody knows from history they make sense. Mm -hmm. How come we've discarded them? Do you, 
where do you see our loss of that idea coming from? Well, we can both talk about this. I, I mean, I, I think part of it is that it's just, it's more fun to market things that here's an easy way to do it. That, that that's, you know, the power of positive thinking that if you just, you know, I mean, Napoleon Hill, I mean, I would read these old books and I just couldn't, you know, believe this stuff that Napoleon Hill had, he's sold just countless, I mean, it's still being sold today. There's, you know, tens of millions of books. And his, he had a strategy where if you wanted to make money, you first had to think exactly how much money you wanted, then write it down on a piece of paper, and then every day pick up that piece of paper and look at it. And that's how you got it, you know. Um, and I mean, I can understand why people like to believe that kind of stuff. It's, maybe it's a religious belief. It's a lot easier than, than you know, actually going to work. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, there was also, I think, I mean, one reason just historical was um, um, uh, the triumph of the will, the Nazi documentary, that when Hitler is doing your, is kind of, is the spokesman for willpower, it's not, that's not good for your brand, I think. <laughs> Roy, what do you think of the first step of the AA? Oh, well, uh, I have to say I've been much influenced by uh, your writings on the topic, and uh, I'm going to appreciate uh, the chance to meet you. Uh, but uh, very much uh, right on, the, uh, among other points, the, uh, the people who are addicted, uh, they, uh, they like the idea that it's, it's beyond their control and that it's a hopeless uh, thing. So the, the, the victim mentality really appealed uh, to both the, uh, the addicts and to the, uh, the, you know, the medical uh, for-profit uh, establishment that, that, that treats them. Um, the idea that well, it just takes willpower to to resist it. That's uh, you know that's not nearly as appealing. Uh, so, and then there's you know the bias of what they study. You know, most people who ever smoked have quit smoking, but they did it on their own. Uh, only a minority have done it in these professional programs. And I think uh, the way to the evidence is starting to show that the the people who quit who have trouble quitting addictions who are in these programs they often have multiple psychological problems and so they are kind of hopeless cases but it's a huge mistake to treat them as the norm uh, it's a bit like the old idea that uh, homosexuals are are neurotic and then that uh, psychology embraced that for a long time but you know they were dealing with people in therapy who had often <laughs> multiple problems and finally uh, other homosexuals came forward and said well we're not neurotic we're we're <laughs> healthy and we want to be recognized as such but that's not going to happen with addiction because all the addicts uh, benefit from the idea that it's be, it's uh, out of their power i mean there there's the, the AA uh, philosophy has a built-in contradiction when it says, well, you can't do it. Uh, you need to surrender to a higher power. But meanwhile, you better get busy and do all these, th these other things and, and actually quit yourself. Uh, so, you know, the higher power is not swatting the beer bottle away. You're, you're actually doing it yourself. Do you see uh, yourselves actually being in conflict and battling with that kind of a cultural concept that's being promulgated all the time? Um, do I see myself that way? Uh, well, uh, is, is our, our book didn't really address uh, addiction or uh, tackle it on, but... Uh, he had a in, whole chapter. Come my, on now. My, my <laughs> subsequent uh, um, uh, work and thinking about it, I've, I've, uh, I guess you're right, I've, I've read a lot more since then. Uh, and so, yes, I, I think the way to the evidence just doesn't sustain the idea that addiction is uh, something that's out of your control. Uh, I mean, again, to go back to the alcohol thing, the, the beer doesn't pour itself down your throat, the cigarette doesn't uh, light itself and, uh, and, and put in your mouth. People are really voluntarily cooperating to uh, ingest these substances. It's, it goes with all these things about giving yourself permission and allowing yourself to do it and taking a short term instead of a long term focus. All these things really play into uh, addiction and sustained addiction and that's, uh, uh, that's I think what uh, contributes and so when people tell themselves well I can't really help it I'm addicted they give themselves excuses and in that way that contributes to uh, to making it worse uh, what's the connection between uh, people that commit crimes and a lack of willpower if any and is there, are there any uh, implications for like how to fight recidivism 
Uh, way back uh, when I started writing my first scholarly book on self-control, uh, around 1990, uh, I was reading literature, and right then a book came out called A General Theory of Crime. Uh, I was struck by that because uh, it was by criminologists, not by psychologists. I wanted to know what are they going to talk about poverty or relative deprivation or uh, disadvantaged youth or whatever. And they said low self-control was the key uh, to understand it. And uh, I thought, oh, okay, that's, that's quite striking. Um, obviously, after that bold statement came out, there was a flood of research in criminology trying to test and see whether that's true. And that has continued to hold up. It's been confirmed over and over again that, yes, uh, I mean, there are lots of kinds of evidence, uh, going back to the original thing, criminals, the, the act of committing the crime certainly is a sign of low self-control. Uh, criminals don't specialize like they do in the movies where they're less, just like any other professional. They tend to get arrested over and over again for different crimes. It's just an impulsive lifestyle. Uh, others have looked at what criminals do on legal things, and there they show low self-control too. Criminals are more likely to smoke cigarettes, uh, to be uh, late for work if they have jobs, to be involved in unplanned pregnancies and traffic accidents and uh, all sorts of things. It's just sort of a general screw-up uh, uh, lifestyle. Uh, that that contributes to it. Uh, so that appears to be true. In fact, the paper just uh, came across my desk today linking low self-control to a, a variety of minor public uh, misbehaviors, including uh, drunk dialing, uh, binge drinking. There was academic fraud, which is a bit more serious. Uh, even, uh, uh, we're all adults, public flatulence is associated. Uh, it's, uh, John and I prefer to speak to audiences with higher self-control. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so that is true. Now, uh, my, my colleague, June Tangney, uh, has been doing research in prisons with, if we develop the uh, trait scale to measure self-control. She said it is a huge predictor of recidivism that, uh, uh, that uh, prisoners who have higher self-control within the range they have are less likely to be rearrested uh, when they leave. And if they can uh, bolster and train them in self-control in some ways, it really reduces uh, their chances of being rearrested. You probably also know um, going to the nutrition and glucose thing, uh, uh, criminals tend to eat very bad diets. Uh, I initially read uh, one of the memoirs of the gang wars. Right? I had a, another book on, on evil and violence. Uh, I remember reading, a guy said, well, when we were in gang wars, I, I remember we just started feeling really bad, and I wondered if it was all the junk food. As mm -hmm. it turns out, when they're in the middle of a gang war, they don't go home at 6 o'clock and have a nice, healthy meal with leafy vegetables and, and greens and stuff like that. They, they, they stop at fast food places and eat junk food and stuff, and, and that's really bad for your, your glucose over time. Uh, they've done systematic studies in prisons where they'll take the, the, the diet and improve it you know, for half the population and not the others. And the, the ones who uh, you know, take the vitamin supplements and eat vegetables, their, their disciplinary uh, problems in prison drop by half uh, as long as the study. And then as soon as the study's over, uh, then they go back to getting in trouble again. Uh, so you know, diet, training, self-control, all those things are really useful in, in, in combating crime. And, and it continues to be. I guess they won't say it's, it's the key anymore. You know, things in social science get more complicated over time. Uh, but it's still a major key and probably the biggest single uh, uh, predictor of, of criminality. It's also gone the other way in that they, they, there's a huge study in New Zealand where they track kids for decades. And they had a lot of measures yeah. of self-control when they were young by their teachers, their parents, and tests. And they found that it, did, it, it predicted bad outcomes and everything. It, it, in a much, and it did predict your likelihood of being in jail, basically. So. Yeah, yeah. How well a kid did at self-control at age 10 predicted whether he'd have been arrested yeah. by, by age 30. Yeah. That's quick question. A question in the right corner over here. Um, do you draw any distinction? Hi. Hi. Do you draw any distinction between discipline and obeying rules um, and self-control? And also, do you find that the positive effects have sort of a dif diminishing, or ultimately diminish for people who are, you know, particularly persnickety or neurotic or anal, just by nature and their personality? Go ahead. Uh, a couple of key points. Uh, well, Self-control is a broader term than, than discipline, but uh, discipline is certainly an important uh, instance of it and, and following rules. And it's, it's one of the things we evolved to do. It's, it's what 
makes humans separate from others is we're able to create civilization, but civilization only works if most of the people follow most of the rules most of the time. So that capacity to do it. I, I sometimes, when I lecture on, on, on human nature, I say, uh, well, if, if we hired a gorilla and gave him a job and a, <laughs> and a car and an apartment and so on, why wouldn't that work? But uh, you can't consistently obey the rules enough to, uh, to, to sustain uh, civilized society. Um, now, your other question, diminishing returns. Uh, we've looked, looked for that. When It turns out there, there is such a thing as, say, the over-controlled child, but that, that's not an excess of self-control. That's uh, it's basically a fearful outlook from uh, being overly in inhibited or uh, uh, something like that. When we test self-control, you know, told you Tang and I developed the scale to measure it, and we thought it would be really cool if we could show that uh, it goes up and up in terms of the benefits, and then at the high levels turns down. And we beat the statistics uh, every which way to try to get that downturn, and we just not could find it. Uh, could not find it. It seemed like as far as within the normal range, the more self-control you have, uh, the better. And uh, you can put it to bad things, and there are traits, as you say, like being anal and, and so on. But the people who have these uh, compulsive traits and so on, they're not highly self-controlled. In fact, they say, uh, I, I'm lacking self-control. They see their, their indulgence. They're sort of uh, trying these other things as a way to, to try to reestablish some, some, uh, some control. So it's not an excess of self-control. I think self-control, like intelligence, it's a tool. You can use it for bad things. Uh, but basically, the more you have, the better. Okay. Um, this is really helpful because I think it explains, but I want to vet an approach that I've been developing that works and doesn't seem like it should make sense. So the first thing is the difference between um, affirmative statements and I guess what are now called interrogative self self-interrogative statements. So like you get up in the morning and instead of saying, I will exercise today, if you say, will I exercise today, you're more likely to exercise, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Which one is more likely to work? The, the, uh, the affirmative, when you right? ask, no, the if affirmative statement <clears throat> lets your self-conscious sort of off the hook. Yeah, I've committed to exercising so I don't have to worry about it. And then you're going to bed and you say, damn, I forgot to exercise. Whereas if you keep asking yourself, will I exercise, the only way of answering that is by exercising, right? So that's the first thing. So I use those two. I mean, there's a lot of research recently on, on this. So I use those two. So then the first case, when I don't want to do something, I say I'll do it. And <laughs> so then I just forget about it. And like you say, the, and, and the other thing is you say, when you put the thing that's not really doable on the list, it sort of nags you, but the but the co corollary to that is if you can get if you can not be nagged by it, you don't have to do it, right? So I put all these things on the list that my wife wants done, and it's on the list, and then I don't do it. <laughs> Does that make any sense? So <clears throat> you look confused. No, no, no. So, yeah. so uh, and there's a wonderful thing called um, this is a guy out at Stanford. I I can't remember his name. Perry, I think it was his name. He wrote a thing called um, um, Structured um, Procrastination. Procrastination. Structured Procrastination. And I wonder what you think of that, because that certainly works for me. I didn't know the procrastination thing. Uh, Structured Procrastination, I like to call it the power of positive procrastination, right. which is the. You know, the way to get, you know, say to clean your closet out is to, is to, is to put at the top of your list, do taxes. And so you'll, to avoid doing taxes, you will clean your closet. And you basically, um, um, and, and, and there are funny stories about it. And, and the guy who does it is very funny. I mean, he says, you know, I accomplish all this stuff because he just has these impossible things at the top of the list. So to avoid doing them, he'll do the other stuff. So, and I mean, there actually is something to be said for, you know, if you're, you know, if you're stuck on something, just, you know, you clean. I mean, it's often said freelance writers have the cleanest houses around. You know, they just, they just <laughs> will do anything rather than, than, yeah. you know, than write. So, but, but I think that with the Zagarnik effect, you just end up being nagged by it all the time. It's just so much better to, you know, just say I'm going to do it for 90 minutes. I'll, whatever happens, happens. But I won't do anything else, and then you're free the rest of the day. Right. I guess you I know. put it down so I give yeah. the list to my wife so she yeah. doesn't nag. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've skipped over a couple of times um, 
children, discipline, and impulsivity, uh, which connecting those dots, I got to ADHD. <coughs> and um, you know, a, a, a key characteristic of ADHD is impulsivity, which seems to be remarkably controlled by these medications. Does that mean that these medications also somehow increase willpower? Um, I don't know how those medications work, and I don't well, know do you, that do, we know. Do you have know. a neurological, uh, um, uh, have you mapped willpower neurologically? Because what they say is the medications work by stimulating your prefrontal cortex, which is where your higher management functions is, and presumably where your willpower is. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm not a brain person, but I have a, a bunch of colleagues who uh, have done that kind of work. and. Uh, you know, in, in broad terms, yes, you're right. Uh, the, the front of the brain uh, is more the control part. The, the back is the uh, wanting and urging part. Um, uh, but uh, exactly how self-control works there, it's been surprisingly difficult for them to get that uh, mapped and uh, uh, you know ascertain exactly what happens with uh, depletion. There are just some new studies coming out in the last couple of years starting to show uh, uh, you know which which regions uh, work with it, but you know to go from there then to the the, the drug operation, uh, that's another big step. Um, so if if you're looking for a way to uh, increase willpower, the idea of I mean I, it's appealing to think oh, I can just take a pill and then I'll uh, I'll be uh, you know, have great willpower, but. Uh, uh, I, I wouldn't no, bet on I, that. I was more wondering whether kids with ADHD are doomed to um, to poor willpower. Um, in well, they do have great focus, though, when it comes to, I mean, especially, uh, you know, entrepreneurs often have ADHD, and they're very focused on one thing when they can do it. So, I mean, I wonder if the drugs you're doing are basically the effect of, like, your computer shutting you off the web. It's just not letting certain stimu stimuli come through and, and letting you focus on what, I mean, this is a very crude, you know, um, 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 analogy for it, but um, but there have uh, there have also been some brain studies trying to look at. I mean, Roy's experiments are looking what actually at at, at the physical mechanics of self control. I mean, they've done experiments where they um, give people a glass of lemonade either with Splenda or sugar, and and you do the sugar not because it's a great thing for you because it, it works very quickly. And when in a glass of lemonade will improve your willpower right away. That people have more, but it doesn't work if there's not sugar in it because you want that glucose. And there have been some brain studies now where they're they're trying to see what happens when that sugar goes in, actually, right, and, and to see. Uh, yes, it does seem to reverse uh, some of the patterns that show up when people are depleted. But uh, uh, again, brain research is is is, is messy at, at present. Uh, very imprecise. Uh, so. Um, our next guest here uh, at the next session is Sally Sattel, who's been pretty skeptical of the brain stuff. So okay. she's been, good. Yeah. So. Hi, uh, I was wondering if you would speculate on um, our evolutionary history so that our ancestors probably uh, wouldn't have a problem with willpower if, if they were uh, getting attacked by a tiger. They'd know what to do. So I wonder how much of this is a mismatch with just things that are evolutionarily familiar uh, versus things that are evolutionarily novel. So taxes is something completely novel. So would you speculate on how general willpower might have come about? All right. Uh, um, I think, well, first of all, we think we don't have that much willpower, but we have a more than other species. The, the glass is half full and half empty. We can all imagine life would be better if, <laughs> if we had better self-control than we do. Uh, but uh, as I said, the, the kind of civilized society that we create, we don't see other uh, other creatures being able to to do that, uh, you know, to behave that that flexibly and understand complex hierarchies of rules and so forth. Um, so uh, the key to human evolution was learning to work together socially in, in these new systems, uh, particularly to reach beyond the the, the kin group and the basic uh, genetic selfishness. Uh, that uh, you know, produces what limited cooperation there is in, in, in other species. Uh, so you need to control your behavior, need to, to subdue uh, impulses uh, to go along and comply with the rules of the group. And as I think these would be, have co-evolved, as we do, our ancestors developed better 
self-control uh, for managing themselves, they were able to construct uh, more complicated social systems that were then more effective. Uh, and so the, you know, in, in, in time, the, the groups with the, the more effective social systems were able uh, to supplant and defeat uh, their, their rivals who, who didn't have as much. Um. I mean, there are examples people you know, point out just in primates having some self control. I mean, dogs have self control. There have been experiments where, where you can do ego depletion with a dog if he obeys a, command, a, a stay or sit command for 10 minutes, and then you give him the doggy version of a puzzle to do. The dogs that have to obey the stay command for 10 minutes quit sooner than the dogs that were just relaxing inside yeah. a cage. And, and they can also be reversed with lemonade if you, or, or with sugar. Um, and there's some thought that just self-control evolved in very basic sense that um, in a group of, if there's an alpha male who, who, who gets to eat first, that the others have to exert self-control to not eat that food that's there because if they don't, then the group's going to spend all its energy fighting and they're not going to survive. And similarly, people have suggested that, you know, that our civilization, that, that ancient hunter-gatherers who could get tubers and not eat them right away when they were poisonous but had the self-control to basically put them aside or, and, and do that, that all these things basically were essential for survival. And I think your point, though, about the, that we're somewhat mismatched is that you know, throughout a lot of history, there were fairly simple rules, you know, and um, in the Middle Ages, somebody didn't, you know, have a lot of decisions all day long. You basically worked, did one job, you got, you know, the, the main temptations were getting drunk, which wasn't really even that bad a thing. Most people were drunk much of the time. And, you know, an adultery, but, you know, I mean, you weren't trying to decide what kind of career to go into. You had a very clear code of conduct from, that was enforced by God in your mind, by the church, by your neighbors. And, and the reason the Victorians got so obsessed with willpower is that they were concerned about all these villagers leaving their churches and their communities where there was social control going into these cities and suddenly you know, people don't believe in God anymore, there's no church. So they really worried how can we have people control themselves without feeling that there's a church and a God doing it. And so um, that was really the whole idea that we have to inculcate character in people. And I think it's gotten worse today because we all have choices all day long about every second at your, it's your desk, you can you know, goof off. Whereas a peasant in the field didn't have a lot of choices. Um, so how easily or, and how precisely can self-control be measured? Uh, is, is there a standard scale and, and is there a way that I can assess my own self-control? <laughs> um, Unfortunately, there's no single gold standard measurement. In our experiments, we do the, all these different behavioral things um, to, you know, so we can compare one group against another and say, well, this group did worse than that group. Uh, that works, but uh, they're all indirect. Uh, we do have, as I said, their personality scales, uh, the one that uh, you know, June Tangney and I developed. Um, it's a series of questions, uh, but if I think if you fill it out knowing that this is measuring your self-control, that could uh, uh, weaken the validity of it and make you want to just say, oh, yeah, I'm really good. <laughs> uh, the, the questions then, it becomes obvious what they're, what they're getting at. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say the short answer is no. It, there's not an easy way to, to test it. You can uh, yeah, maybe, maybe ask your wife or your roommate. and. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, in experiments, the, uh, there are techniques like how long you can hold your hand in, in ice water, um, how long you can squeeze a, a grip, um, how long you work on a puzzle that's not solvable. Those are experimental ways to, yeah. you know, to measure perseverance. So. But those are all somewhat relative. I mean, the cold water bothers some people more than others, and so it takes more self-control uh, for some people to do it than others. I had a question um, whether uh, willpower is just one element of self-control um, and what the um, impact of identity or ideology would be. And if you permit me, just a personal thing. So February is my clean month. So substance-wise, no weed, no alcohol, no caffeine. And especially on the alcohol, that's very difficult. But because I do it every year, I know I'm Scott, I, February's my clean month, I'm not tempted. And it's become very easy for me to do. So I don't rely on willpower. If I relied on willpower, I would fall short. I rely on sort of an identity and ideology. I was wondering if 
you had any thoughts about uh, that? Um, what well, you're basically doing there on uh, um, the strategy we're talking about, conserving your willpower. And one of the ways to do that is is what's called bright line rules. So basically, when you have a very clear rule, I mean, that's one of the reasons that not drink, you know, that it's much easier to stop drinking than, than to lose weight because you can have a rule, a clear rule, I don't drink after six, I don't drink at all, I don't drink in February, and that's easy to do, but you can't say I'm not gonna eat. So it's, it's not a bright line rule. And, and the more you can do these rules that are very clear and easy to follow so you know when you've gone across it, it gets easier, and then, as you say, once you establish a rule, it's hard to do it at first, but then once it becomes a habit, it's not really a decision you're making anymore. Right. And then, therefore, you're not really depleting your willpower to do it. I like the choice of February, too. It's the shortest month, so. Uh... <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> we have right. one, okay, we'll, we'll... okay. I wanna ask one other question. I, it, it takes to his question, and it takes the, there is a, very common view that willpower or self-control isn't a matter of your personal ability. It's not that much different from person to person. It's just a matter of how you manage it. Um, how much would you say is willpower versus the management of your willpower? It all depends if you've read our book or not. I think that's really <laughs> that, yeah. That's the two basic groups you have, I think. Yes. Um, um, I would say they're they're both important. There are real differences. Uh, you know, going back to uh, Walter Michelle and those marshmallow studies of the kids at age four, uh, how they performed in the lab test of being able to uh, wait ten minutes to uh, to eat the cookie or the marshmallow, uh, predicted uh, how well they did in college and uh, how later on how much money they made in their careers. Uh, so there is a there are differences there, uh, but. But using it properly or misusing it, that's a, a, a large contributing factor as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, some of those people who have very messed up lives could have, you know, had the willpower to do better, or maybe had it, but just uh, devoted it in the wrong things. There's things like overconfidence, uh, thinking you have... Uh, uh, more willpower than you actually have. The study I liked where they, they took smokers and they said, you want to bet on yourself, can you watch this movie without smoking? And uh, you, can, can. you can have, you can have s <laughs> there are different levels of, you know, one is cigarettes are in the other room. It was a, it was a movie that glorified smoking. Cigarettes in the other room. And uh, that was like worth, I think they did in Europe, so it was three euros if you could do that. Uh, versus, you know, have them on the table, it'd be six euros. And the, uh, the highest was you could get 12 euros if you could watch this movie, holding an unlit cigarette in your mouth uh, for it. So people say, oh, 12 euros, yeah, I can do that. None of them completed that, you know. The ones who say, I'll go for three euros and leave it in the other room, it's a much lower goal. As John said, go for uh, reachable <laughs> goals. They were much more successful at it. Uh, so, you know, these were the, the same people. They were, uh, you know, put into different... Is there, are there big differences in willpower or self-control from person to person, or is it... There are definitely differences, yes. There are substantial differences. Uh, but uh, again, it sort of takes some self-control to manage your self-control right. Uh, so whether they could have done better if they had planned better and plotted and not exposed themselves to temptation. Uh, you know, if you recognize your limitations, you're trying to not drink for a month, you don't spend as much time going into bars. Uh, but the person who thinks, eh, I can go in, I'll just have a Coke. Uh, but then, uh, then they yes, then of they course. fail. Yeah. yeah. That makes right. sense. Um, well, thank, thank you very much. You know, thank, uh, 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 thank you, Dan Gluck, for hosting us. Thank you, Reason, for holding this. Thank you. Um, um, and uh, uh, that's it for the Museum of Sex.